when you see it like that, you, you then understand why water is everything. Because we are, in, we are made of compartments of organized water that are in interaction of the purity of the water with the electromagnetic field, which is the energy source. A warm water welcome to all of you listening live right now and anyone who listens to this recording in the future. You might be a track pilot, a paddler, an experienced adventure guide, or a beginner, and it's all new for you. Or you might not have anything to do with paddling, and you're just curious, you're still in the right place. I'm your host, Nicholas Jones. We're really grateful that you've joined us, and we want you to know we appreciate your listening and the time you're offering to this new conversation. We may not know each other, but we're all connected by virtue of one thing, water. It's the water that we have in common. It's been around for millions of years, the water that connects us all and flows inside us and around us. And as you join us, please type into the chat window and let us know what the nearest body of water is to you, okay? And what is it that you really love about that water? So let us know what the nearest body of water to you and what is it you really love about that body of water? You're listening to episode eight of a new series on tracks, Zoom Away Blue Fridays. This series is a new conversation unfolding like a gift. You have likely felt the positive benefits of being in, on, or around water. But well, we're gonna look at the deeper inherent reasons for that. In this series, Wellness Equals Water, we're taking a journey with you to discover the connection between water and wellness within. We'll unpack the many dimensions of water and how it impacts human health and biology and the health of the planet. So join us and help us create a blueprint to navigate this journey, leading the way to uncover the source of human vital vitality and possibly redefine our understanding of a new biology and the life charging qualities of water. My name is Nicholas Jones and I'm your host for Wellness Equals Water. I'm speaking to you right now from Sambro Harbor, Nova Scotia, Canada, across from North America's oldest functioning lighthouse. Yeah, the beacon of light is right there. So the nearest body of water to me is the Atlantic Ocean, about 50 meters down our driveway. And what I love about this body of water is that it never stays still. It's always changing moment to moment. And I could spend more time watching that body of water than any TV show or social media channel. So I've been working with Nolan for about 13 years now in the track team. I'm a corporate shaman, a truth seeker, and a sense maker. And my mission is to bring spirit back into work. I'm no expert. I'm constantly asking why, and I try to keep a beginner's mind. To use water as the analogy, I know I'm one drop in the ocean, and that really empowers me. Knowing that the truth is the whole ocean, and we're each as a drop whole, complete, and indivisible, containing a piece of that truth. I'd like to introduce the why of this conversation and how it started in the first place. I'm gonna turn it over to Nolan Bayard, track founder and managing director to set the stage before we jump in. Nolan, we're here at episode eight. And why? <laughs> why did you kick off this conversation? <laughs> well, thanks, Nicholas. And thanks everyone for, for joining this call. Um, you know, to really kind of cut to it, I mean, we're doing the series because I felt pretty deeply, as I've mentioned on previous episodes, that it's time to kind of, like I've said, draw the line in the sand, you know, uh, and ask some simple, critical questions about how does human health and human physiology and health work, you know, really. Um, and of course, it's not what we've uh, been told or, or programmed over uh, over our lifetimes, uh, it's a it's a much different uh, piece than that. And you know, as the sea kayak company, people will say like, "Why are you doing a wellness equals water?" Uh, I'm sure it probably surprised Tom too when when we reached out to him. Um, and and you know, intuitively, from the time that we first got you know brought track to life, and and as we've worked with customers around the world with our portable sea kayaks we've kind of recognized this intuitively, this role of water being a lot more than what we 
you know, what most people think of it as being. Uh, and there's just a whole lot more to it. Uh, and this benefit of being, you know, we know there's a benefit of being in nature, but specifically in water, because we're made of the stuff, um, there's, there's a, an incredible um, uh, aspect of water that most people are just not aware of. And so we're doing the series to bring to light a lot of those aspects of water and how it relates to our health and the health of the, of the planet. And, you know, I've said that, you know, I've been saying this before that we got to get clear, you know, clear the clutter and get to the heart of it, get to the heart of the matter. Um, and what's really going on in human health and what's going on in the human body uh, are these are the kinds of questions that I think we want to ask and we think that need to be asked. Um, so that's where today's, you know, I'd say very special guest uh, comes into this and in, in, uh, Dr. Tom Cowan. Uh, I will call him Tom. Uh, he's Dr. Tom Thomas Cowan. Uh, I will call him Tom. He's very accomplished. Nicholas will give a, a deeper dive into his into some of his background. Uh, but what I like about him is he's he's real. He's common sense uh, human being. Uh, and uh, and just to give some background, I learned about uh, Tom. You know, probably at the start of this this whole uh, pandemic response situation that we've all been. Uh, dealing with uh, this year, and and I, I'll say a couple of things that to me just made me appreciate Tom and his approach and how he how he does things. Is he asks what I would say are like simple, you know, fundamental questions. He's he's actually willing to ask some of those questions that others others aren't willing to ask. And then what I've observed is the rigor, how rigorous. Uh, he is about answering those things, putting it into some very real common sense uh, approaches to to how how it works and really helping people understand things at a core level. But asking those questions that most people aren't willing to ask, and then and and actually answering them in a way that just makes sense. Uh, so we've called him a sense maker. Um, the other thing I've observed about Tom is he really taps into what I would call old wisdom. And, and something I've come become more aware of over the last, you know, especially nine months, but probably over the last number of years, is that some of the best wisdom that I've come to, to learn about has been in this kind of 100 to 140 years ago range, you know, when you're looking at guys like, uh, you know, Rudolf Steiner, and some of the people that, that Tom's been inspired by. Uh, and it's really sage wisdom, but it's, it's not new, you know. Um, we call him a bit of a pioneer. Uh, it was part of the, the introduction of Tom. He's, he's, a, he's a pioneer, but it's not, in a way, it's not pioneering thought other than when it references back to that time before we got distracted for maybe 10 decades with a lot of other stuff going on. And so uh, the other thing I've uh, appreciated about Tom is you're willing to look at observable phenomena and like really get to the what's really happening and, and break that down. So that's something I've really been, um, you know, uh, appreciative of um, in terms of your, your approach. That ancient wisdom, I think the opportunity right now in, our, in this particular time is to apply some of this old sage wisdom, this, this ancient wisdom to, to modern problem solving, like really rolling up our sleeves and saying, what do we need to do as a society to get to some of the answers that need to be had to shift things uh, going forward. So that that ancient wisdom into problem into modern problem solving is something that I I think Tom particularly brings uh, brings forward. Um, so we're going to get to the heart uh, into the heart and the blood a little bit in this, and that's all I'm going to say. And we'll let let Nicholas uh, reveal some more of that and and tease it out from from Tom and his background and some of the things he's uh, been you know bringing forward. So right now, what I want to do is just pass it back to Nicholas and and really introduce Tom proper, and uh, and then we'll kick this off. <laughs> Thanks, Nolan. I really appreciate that. So uh, the conversation is going to be about forty-five minutes long. If you've joined us before, you know how this goes, and we'll have a we'll try to fit a ten or fifteen minute Q and A in. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we didn't want these conversations to be overly structured and controlled, so we're going to flow like a strong, mature river, intentional but meandering, that still gets to the ocean. We just ask you to flow with us. Uh, our chat window is managed by Curtis. So if you have any comments or questions, 
drop them into the chat window. We'll see if we can get to them at the end of the, at the Q and A, okay? And to keep our sound quality as good as possible live, please mute yourself or we'll mute you until the Q and A starts up. So I wanna kick this off by acknowledging that we're about 70% water. The earth is about the same, 70% water. And we're gonna be talking mostly about water here. To date in this series, we've learned that water whispers to your mind and shifts your moods. It has an innate intelligence and it can paint pictures when it freezes in order to communicate with us. We learned about resilience and persistence in a ballad about water and rock from an absolutely amazing and inspiring adventurer. We also heard how through an intimate relationship with water, over time, we can experience a truly transformative, transformative shift in our wellness. We were illuminated about the relationship between light and water from the wisdom of an environmental health expert and biophysicist engaged in quantum biology. Then we were taken on an inner journey of intuition by a guide for our consciousness, discovering that water is the only element that reflects us to ourselves like a mirror for humanity. And in our last episode, we drew from an ancient well of wisdom offered by our own track elder, circling back 10,000 years to the origin stories of the kayak. So in summary, know your water, know yourself. You were born in water, you cannot live without water. And if we move beyond just managing it as a resource or using it, there's a boundless gift available. We're now coming up to a special time of the year, the solstice, the winter solstice. So I'd like you to consider it's a time of uh, long nights and shorter days, obviously, but it's also traditionally a time of going within. So this episode and this guest is aligning with the cosmos. Let's jump in. I wanna introduce our very special guest today, Dr. Thomas Cowan. You know, as a pioneer, our guest today has been on a lifelong quest of discovery and deep inquiry. He's divining the right questions to ask and then integrating diverse knowledge to draw useful answers for humanity. As a sense maker, he brings a common sense approach and builds useful paradigms that bring refreshing coherence to complex subjects. He's even demystifying expert advice and empowering us in the process. As a doctor, he's uniquely open aware and follows his own heart, working as a holistic mentor to other doctors. As an earth keeper, he's a gardener and a healer of the earth. He's working with and learning from nature to improve human, ecological and economic health. And finally, as an author, we'll be drawing from his books, we might refer to them. The ones we'd like to talk about are Human Art, Cosmic Heart, Cancer and the New Biology of Water, and most recently, The Contagion Myth, which we Highly recommend, not just because it was banned from the world's largest bookstore. So on behalf of the Global Track community now, we're delighted and grateful to welcome Tom to join us. Tom, how are you? I'm good, thank you for <laughs> that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, you know, personally, Tom, I have uh, rigorously been following your your work, your thinking, your speaking, whatever podcasts and things I have time to get on. And, you know, I, I wish you the best because you are the voice of the future leadership of health and humanity, okay? I just want you to know that. So, you know, it, it's a privilege for me, especially, and it's a privilege for all of us at Track, even the ones that don't know you, that you've given some time to join us. So we'd like to know what the nearest body of water is to you, buddy. <laughs> I think it's the Hudson River. Awesome, awesome. I, mean, I just moved here. Um, yeah. I think that's probably the nearest body of water. Have you had a chance to visit and get to know it? Not really, no. Yeah. There's also well, a creek on our property and a little pond on our property, so that may count too. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. So what is it you really love about the creek and the pond? Uh, I don't think anything quite yet. <laughs> <laughs> when did you move? Uh, a few months ago. A few months ago. Okay. Yeah. Well, I, I'm I, sure. I, if I if I answered that, I would just be making something up. So I'd rather not do that. Yeah. Well, you let us know when you've had a conversation with it. That would be awesome. Yeah, I will. So we want to jump into a little bit of a Genesis story, get an idea of how you started on your journey with with water, right? Um, so you, you know, I read, I, I read your books and, I, and, I, and I, I read a personal story that you shared uh, about a canoe trip to Boundary Waters, right? West of Lake Superior. 
at the border of Canada and the US. And in one of your books, you talked about an existing heart issue. And you said it launched me into the next phase of my understanding of the heart. This path led to water and the movement of water and the relevance of love in maintaining the health of the heart. Was that your first impactful experience with the element of water? Uh, I, I would say no. Uh, when I was uh, uh, growing up, say 14, 15, uh, every summer I would go on canoe trips to Algonquin Park in Canada. I lived mm. in Michigan. And they, I would say those are probably the most, if I look back on my childhood, those are probably the most, I would say the happiest times, uh, particularly one where I ended up going with some really good friends, at least at that time. And we, we, we had a great time. We, we spent a week just canoeing in the, in the Algonquin Provincial Park. And I remember very clearly that one night, we, we used to, because there were a lot of mosquitoes, so we used to put our tent and eat, and then we would go back on the, on the water and just sort of float there. And we saw the Northern Lights. And interestingly, there was, there was a huge display of the Northern Lights that I'd never seen uh, like that before. In fact, I think I'd never seen them. And in fact, I don't think any of us had ever heard of that before. And you can imagine five or six of us having never seen or heard of this thing suddenly <laughs> seeing <laughs> the Northern Lights. And we, you know, we thought God himself was speaking to us. Uh, and, you know, then I took my, ch so I did a lot of lake canoeing. I never did like river canoeing or whitewater. A lot of lake canoe camping. And that, that, it was a big thing for me. So mm -hmm. that's probably as far as physical connection with water, that's probably how I got started. That's awesome. Uh, Northern Lights uh, are probably the worst description for uh, the wonder that that is. And, yeah, and right. anybody, anybody in Canada has, has you know, just it, is in awe, you know, and, you know, if anything, anything is a display of electrification, you know, yeah. natural electrification, that is, that's awesome. So, Tom, um, you're a doctor, right? You're a medical doctor. And I understand well, you I'm you retired. Retire? Okay, I'm you're retired. So I'm awesome. officially soon <laughs> not to be a doctor. So yes. That, okay. That, that, okay. Excellent. Well, there's this there's this thing in our society which I do want to bring up before we kick it off because you know we've we've introduced you as a doctor. Uh, you know, and, and that is how to listen to a doctor like you, because I think you're quite different from any other doctor. That that goes without saying, actually. And our guest for the last episode was an elder for track, right? And um, we really honored him. And he began the conversation by honoring the lineage of wisdom keepers that came before him. So as part of your Genesis story, right, as, a, as, a, as someone who was trained in, in, in biology and trained in, in, in medical science, um, is there a key mentor or a teacher who's an elder for you that you want to, you want to, you know, honor before we move forward any? any? Uh not too many, but the only one I would say was a guy named Otto Wolf, who was, um, he was a German doctor, he looked just like Beethoven. And he, he was sent to the United States to essentially bring anthroposophical medicine to the United States. So for probably 12 years, a group of young doctors, including myself, would meet with Otto for about a week. And Otto would harass us, basically. And Otto was the smartest guy I've ever met. He knew every, he knew 12 languages. He knew every star, every plant, every constellation, every rock, every, he was a PhD in biochemistry. And he, he there was very little uh, that Otto didn't know. He could play the violin and the piano. And Otto did not suffer fools gladly. And he wasn't shy about saying that. And if you didn't know how to think, Otto, <laughs> he would let you know. And Otto's favorite saying was, substance does nothing. And he also, also, by the way, said the idea that viruses cause disease was a 
total superstition. Uh, but mainly he was, he, he thought that substances are the end product of, of forces, energy pattern, whatever you want to call it. That's what, that's what does stuff mostly with life. And, you know, we've been persuaded that substance does something, even though nobody can actually tell you what substance is, because it doesn't make any sense when you think about it. <laughs> Awesome. So we'll, we'll honor Otto. I think that's a, that's a great kickoff. Um, on the shoulders of Otto and what you've created and offered in the world, I'd like you to be our guide on a special trip. Okay. You know that Track is a kayak company and you are familiar with canoes. And yes. uh, we're going we're gonna to ask you to be a guide on a very special journey. Okay. So just like in kayaking or canoeing, we talk about putting in whether you go into a lake or a stream or a river, that's when you first set up and you put the boat in and you get ready to go on without tipping it and everything. So we want to start an inner journey with you. You remember that sci-fi sci, sci from the 60s, Fantastic Voyage? Yep, I saw it. <laughs> okay, so we're going to shrink a kayak down, put you in it, and we'd like you to take us as a guide on a microscopic level and put ourselves into the uh, bloodstream, okay? So we'll take a journey through the bloodstream to explore the cardiovascular system. And I think it'd be really awesome because I think of these as like our inner streams. We tend to, tend to navigate outer streams and we've got track pilots on this call that are all over the world and they have paddled all of the world's great rivers and their arteries of the earth, right? But if we were to travel inside the body and down the cardiovascular system in a blood vessel, okay? Um, Let's, let's kick it off. Let's talk about flow. You know, like in, 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 in circulation, we relate to when, when things stop flowing, it's not very good, right? So we understand from Eastern traditions, there's chi, there's a natural sense of flow, that when things flow, we're healthy. So what, what is it about the, the circulatory system from your perspective as we're traveling through it that makes it healthy? Uh... That's a good question. Um, I, I think the answer to that is, is it because it flows and because it flows properly. And uh, if, if your blood doesn't flow, that's not a good sign. And if your blood doesn't flow in your legs and then the weight of the blood uh, becomes more than the flow upward, you end up with something called edema in your legs. And that means it's a, you're sick. So I, the, the real question for me, I, I don't know that I could say much about what it's like to be in the blood, but the question is, where does the flow come from? Mm. And, and that has been a question that has occupied human beings for, you know, at least thousands of years, and which unfortunately we have completely incorrect which much to our detriment, because uh, if you don't have blood flow, you can't nourish your tissues and you can't get rid of waste products and then you're sick. And I don't know if I could make an analogy with a, with a river, but the, you know, we all know that stagnant water is not good. You don't drink water from stagnant ponds. You don't drink, uh, and, and we all know, and you guys probably know better than most, that for water to be healthy, it has to flow. It has to flow over other things like rocks and, and you know, plants and stuff. It has to have stuff in the water like fish and algae and bacteria. And it also has to be at a certain sort of temperature. Like if you, you know, Schauberger talked about this a lot, that healthy water is four degrees centigrade and it moves in vortex patterns, which you can easily see. And you know, he talked about when, when the water is four degrees and going in vortexes, then the trout have, that are in the river, so they're, they're like the blood cells or the whatever's in us, white blood cells, they actually have an easy life because they just hang out in the eddies and the force of the water going downstream is equal to the force of, of them going upstream and they don't even have to move really. They just hang out in these eddies. 
And that's why when you fish, you fish into these eddies because the vortex patterns, and that happens because of the, the temperature and the, the, the stream configuration. If you make it into a concrete channel, none of that can happen. And then you end up with a very interesting situation where this, the trout have to swim all the time upstream to stay in the same place. And, and that's very analogous to modern, modern man or woman who basically has to you know, work their ass off just to stay afloat because there's nothing in their world that's actually conducive to actually real life. So we're, and uh, Schauberger had a name for that of a trout that has to live like that is a, a life of useless toil. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds that's familiar. basically uh, modern civilization. We have, uh, you know, there's even an interesting book about that called Bullshit Jobs, where it turns out 37% of Americans say that their job shouldn't be done by anybody. They're completely useless. Um, and it's a little bit more in some other countries, a little bit less. But that, that's not somebody else saying your job is useless. It's you saying nobody should do this job. And that's a life of useless toil. And it's because you're, that person is not in the flow of life. And same thing would happen to a trout. And so you end up getting into what are the conditions that make a healthy stream. And it's the temperature and there's, it has to be shaded by the trees. If you cut down all the trees from the bank of a river, it gets too hot because the sun and then it doesn't form into eddies and vortexes and then the trout have to spend their whole life swimming up river. And it's, it's actually the same in us that if the conditions aren't right, uh, the flow isn't right and then you spend your life trying to uh, essentially metabolically catch up and you never can do it and so then you get sick and it partly comes because we have this uh, you I would call it a superstition that the heart moves the blood around the body which there's no basis in fact for that <laughs> I love it <laughs> and you're gonna I mean, drop can, it you're gonna drop it right there right <laughs> I can explain why if you want but. <laughs> well like we, we definitely want to get into the heart of the matter so you you keep going right uh if we've gone right into the heart um I mean talk more about that yeah if you think about it so you have this approximately one pound 1.1 pound organ it's you know here and so that's not very big and it has variable wall thickness. Some, some layers it's seven layers thick, others it's actually one. You can stick your finger right through it. And then you have these blood vessels coming out and going in. So there's veins coming in and arteries going out. Now the first thing to notice, so there goes heart, arteries, goes like in a, through the aortic arch and then it goes through arterioles, and then to the capillaries, and then it goes through the venules, back to the veins, back to the heart. So that's a circuit. Now, the first thing to notice about that is the speed of the blood movement is the same entering the heart as exiting the heart. And that's the fastest, right? So the fastest velocity is entering, which is equal to the exit speed. And then as it goes down the arteries, it goes slower and slower and slower, and then it stops at the capillaries for the very good reason that it offloads oxygen and food and picks up waste products. So, and by the way, this is about 70,000 miles of blood vessels. So that's a lot of blood vessels. Uh, if you put them end to end, it would be, you know, well, 70,000 miles, or you could put them side to side and it would be like a football field. So if you think about it, so you have this, Im, this, this picture of go faster, it fastest, slow, 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 stop, offload, start going again, faster and faster and faster, same speed into the heart and out of the heart. Now, if, the first thing one would say is if it didn't make the blood go faster, that is the heart, what was the point of the heart? Like if you think about a pump, it would make the blood move faster. 
Now, so we're talking about pressure propulsion, right? Propulsion. And it didn't propel the heart, the blood at all because it was already going fast. And then it goes down and stops. And if you ask a farmer, so you got this uh, water and it's moving really fast and then it goes down the hill and then it goes to a pond and then you wanna get it back up the hill. I think you should put your pump at the top of the hill. And he would think you're a lunatic because anybody would put the pump at the place where the water stopped, which is the pond. Or another way I describe this, if you tell me that I have to take a bus from San Francisco to New York and the bus is gonna stop in St. Louis and the bus doesn't have an engine in it, I'm not getting in the bus because unless there's an engine to make the bus go from St. Louis to New York, once it's stopped, I don't see how it's gonna go back up from St. Louis to New York. So anybody with any sense would say the pump whatever that is, has to be at the capillaries, has to be at the tissues where the blood has stopped moving. Now, it actually gets worse than that because, so first of all, we don't know what the, blood, what the heart is doing to the blood because it doesn't increase the velocity. Second of all, it already, it stopped. We don't have any mechanism for getting it back up from the capillaries to back to the heart. Anybody who thinks that the push from behind pushes the blood and then it stops and then it gets back going again and all that's because of the push from behind. I mean, that's nuts. That's not how anything in, re in the real world works. Now, here's another thing. When you exit the heart, there's a thing called the aortic arch, which is shaped like an arch, like McDonald's arch. Now, think about it. So systole is the maximum push, diastole is, is relaxed. Now we're gonna push 70,000 miles of very viscous fluid that has stuff floating in it that's about the same size as the diameter of the tube. So you better push pretty hard, right? First of all, some people have calculated that the amount of pressure would be about 30 times, 30,000 times the amount of pressure that the heart can generate. So it's ludicrous. But anyways, let's assume that's happened. So systole, maximum pump, and then diastole is, is relaxed. So it goes out of an arch and the arch curves like this. If you think about it, you put a garden hose on a spigot outside your house and it's shaped like this. And then you turn on the water really hard and the, what would happen to the garden hose? It would straighten. Right? Everybody agree? And if you, if you turn it off, the garden hose would go back down to the arch. So that's because if you put more pressure through that, it would straighten the tube. Well, it turns out the aortic arch can bend too, just like that. It turns out at systole, maximum push, it bends in. And then in relaxation, it bends up straight. And I saw that in my, when I was working in a cardiac cath lab in medical school, you put the dye in that goes out of the heart, the aortic arch bends in. And I asked the cardiologist, how come it bends in? <laughs> he said, because that's the way it does. And I said, but that doesn't make any sense. And he said, you wanna get a good grade or not? Or something like that. So I, I learned that you just don't say things like that because that's not how it works, uh, but it makes no sense. Uh, there's a bunch of other reasons, like the blood is actually moving before there's even a heart embryologically. So it turns out that anybody would put the, the pump at the capillaries where the blood is stopped. But then the question is, what is the heart doing? Because it's obviously there. And so what happens is, it's similar to what we call a hydraulic ramp. You put a hydraulic ram in fast moving water and then the water from the river fills up an expandable tank, which has a gate. And then it fills up the tank, which creates positive pressure on the, on the tank side, right? And it expands and a vacuum on the other side of the gate. And then when that pressure differential gets big enough, the gate opens 
the tube gets sucked in because of this negative pressure, which is what you see. And then also the heart muscle is arranged so it creates a spiral or a vortex, which actually adds the energy of life, let's call it, into the blood. So this vortexing energy, just like the stream. So essentially the heart is, slow, is stopping the blood, creating this holding tank because there is expansion and contraction that you can see expands this flexible holding tank. It's arranged so it it's makes a spiral. Interestingly, the first one to identify the vortex or the spiral was Da Vinci who did glass models of, of the heart and said uh, it's, that's what it's doing because he put water and grass seeds in and he could see the spiral. And interestingly, the Sufis who are all about the heart say that moment when the blood stops in the heart and this vortex happens is when God enters the human being. Now, I can't verify that experimentally, but you can see that as an image of why, you know, the heart is connected with love and warmth and it's the center of the human being. It is literally where God enters the human being. So then it creates this vortex that imbues the, the blood with life. And then it goes by itself and then it falls down to the level of the tissues. Now the question then is how does it, what's the pump at the tissues? How does it get back going again? And there's, there's some interesting things about this, but the basic reason is, as I'm sure all you guys know, Water exists in this fourth phase called a gel phase or easy water or structured water or coherent water. And every time you put a hydrophilic surface in with water, it forms this gel layer, which is negatively charged lining the tube. Uh, so, you, so a blood vessel like a capillary is a hydrophilic protein tube. It has water with stuff in it, which we call blood it creates this negatively charged gel layer next to the tube. Um, and then the positive charges go into the water water part, the liquid water. They of course repel each other because they're full of positive charges or protons. That repulsion makes movement. So in other words, you have a, uh, a, a continuous flow device based on the electrostatic properties of water, which is why water can be the only uh, vehicle for life. And then as it goes up the Venus tree, and interestingly, that's Venus and uh, Mars is the R size, the artery side. So the heart is the sun put between Mars and Venus. Um, and, and so that it goes up the veins, up Venus, and it, as any water, as it coalesces from a lake to a river, it goes faster and faster just because of the compression. Every canoeist or kayaker has seen that, right? The narrower the, let the river, the faster the water goes. And so you don't need anything besides an introductory sort of push. And that happens through, through the water. And that explains everything uh, about uh, how the circulation works. And it also explains something very interesting because Gerald Pollack has done some really brilliant experiments where you can see how things affect flow. So you take a beaker of water and you suspend a hydrophilic tube in it, right? Like Nafian or some hydrophilic protein. And then you put it in a lead box and the water stops flowing because there's no separation of charges. And then you put it, take it out of the box and you put it in the sun. And then it starts flowing because the sun becomes the ambient energy source for this separation of charges. And then you take it out of the box and put it on the earth and the electromagnetic field from the earth uh, makes more flow. And you put your hands on it. We have an electromagnetic field and it starts flowing. That then makes sense of the whole history of laying on of hands, right? It increases flow so you can detoxify and bring more nourishment to the tissues. And then you put your dog next to it and it starts flowing or a sheep. But here's where it gets interesting. 
You know what happens if you put your cell phone next to it? <laughs> Probably stops. <laughs> stops flowing. Uh, because uh, the radiation, these are radiation emitting devices, which create an electromagnetic field, which within seconds destructures the water by at least 15 to 20%, and the longer it's there. And so you end up destructuring your water, and then you can't flow, and then you can't uh, nourish your tissues, you can't clear waste products, and we call that being sick. Wow. So having masterfully created uh, and distinguished the natural flow and the source of the natural flow, the relationship also to natural systems around us like sunlight and the earth's energy and all that. So that's how we really work. So the, the heart, um, we, we degraded into something like called a pump and we got focused on the substance and the, and the material side of it. And I kept thinking every time I heard you say pump, uh, my mind was stuck on the jet pump that's actually in our basement here that is trying to push amount of water out of a uh, 80 foot well. Yes. And, and everything you made, everything suddenly makes sense when we shift the paradigm. Yes. So it, 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 what you're calling us to do in a way is to break up the language of pump and, and what it's stuck with and also start to look at it in a completely different way. So let's keep, let's keep going down that journey. If we look at, uh, we talked about electrification, you talk about electromagnetic interference, shall we say, of a natural system. Um, well, let, let me stop you there for a minute, because what happens when you think like this is you start seeing illness differently. Mm. So for instance, uh, you know, hundreds of millions of people have what they call high blood pressure. So, so that means there's the, the, the blood vessels, particularly the arteries, have squeezed down and they create a higher pressure inside the vessel. Now, the question is, why does that happen? And if you ask the normal doctor, he has no idea. They call it idiopathic hypertension, which means, well, I won't say that, but <laughs> the idiots, I will say, the idiots <laughs> don't know why they have it. But the problem, so what, what this taught me is here's why that happens. So you have flow and your body wants flow. But because you're not out in the sun, because you don't eat good food, because you don't connect with the earth, because you spend your life on Zoom calls and not with real people and real dogs and real rivers and real wood, and et cetera, you have weak flow because you don't have the energy to do it and your water is polluted. It's got fluoride and glyphosate and chlorine. And so you've got weak flow. Now, the question that every human being and every doctor should ask themselves, but they don't, is what would I do if I was the body? I got weak flow here, that's an intolerable situation. The answer is the same as your plumber would do, is narrow the tubes, right? That's a compensatory therapeutic maneuver. Now, you could say, yeah, but Tom, if you keep narrowing the tubes, you're eventually gonna have no flow and it'll kill you. And if I was your body, I would say, I know, but you're, you, you, you won't stop doing those things. And so I've got no choice right now. So I'm gonna narrow the tubes, increase the flow, and hope someday you figure this out so that you get real flow and I can lay off narrowing the tubes. Now, the reason I know that this is correct is that's how I did medicine. And you know, I was in a situation where I, I had to be successful. I had to take people who had high blood pressure and get them so that they didn't have high blood pressure, which is different than giving them a drug to widen the tubes, right? You can do that and it will lower the tube and then you'll end up with say erectile dysfunction because there's no more pressure to make that system work. Or you end up with a stroke because you don't have any blood flow to your brain. Or you end up getting diabetes, which is a known consequence of taking high blood pressure medicines because you can't flush the toxins out of your tissue. So I had to do it in another way, which is say, here, drink real water, you know, structured, healthy, not polluted water, 
connect to the earth, get out in the sun, maybe do a few other things. And then once you convince the body, I have now restored flow, the blood pressure goes away. And then they don't have it anymore. Not, they don't need to, you know, and people say, yeah, but they still need to eat good food and, and be out in the sun. And I say, right. <laughs> I mean, fair enough. You know, I, I, you could say that's not a cure either. They still have to live like a human being. So I, would, I, I am guilty of saying that people should live like a human being and not try to poison themselves and not ever get out in the sun and with people and dogs and sheep and canoe on rivers and all that stuff. Yes, guilty as charged. <laughs> when I, uh, when I uh, go out into the world, Tom, and deal with all of the craziness out there, um, and, I, and, I, and I decline to mask myself, I'll tell people I have sapien gnosis. And it, uh, it is a childhood disease, right? It's uh, a knowing person. Yes. <laughs> I, cannot, I cannot indulge any further in this, right? Right. So I, I, love I know that. how to think. Yeah. So where did we lose trust in nature? Where did that go off so badly? You know, like if you're able to dig under and see how it works, where did all of us start to defer to the allopathic priests and give up, you know, trusting our hearts and our bodies? I'll tell you, and let me, you know, I, I have maybe 15 or so minutes. If I can, yeah. I, I, haven't, uh, I haven't written about this, so I think it'll be fun for you guys. Uh, and it's, cool. it is a theory. I, I happen to think I'm correct. And if I could use you as a foil, I think it would be fun for you guys. Is that <laughs> all right? We're in. And then I'll answer that question. Yeah. So I'm gonna ask, ask you a series of questions. Mm -hmm. So, um, the, the, the question we're trying to get at is what is a human being made of, right? That's sort of fundamental to this. So give me an answer to that question. You got one sentence, that's it. I am made of potential. Got it. So here's the problem. If you asked a hundred people, I don't think you would get the same answer as you just gave from all hundred. You may, you may not agree with me. Not only that, if you ask the Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic and Native American people, uh, they may agree with you. And I'm not saying you're wrong, but I don't think they would all give that same answer. And the way that I do the world is I start from what I know to be true. So here's my answer. A human being has a head and ears and eyes and nose and most people have two arms and two legs and hands and skin and a bunch of other things. Every, you agree? Yeah. <laughs> and not only that, every human being I think I've ever met would agree and Chinese medicine would agree, Ayurvedic, shaman medicine, Native American, everybody agrees with that. Okay, next, what's underneath that? Some Think form like of you're energy. a six-year-old because that's six how I old? see the world. Um, love. <laughs> yeah. All right. Here's my answer. You got organs under there. <laughs> oh, underneath, like literally. Okay. Underneath. You're talking We're to literal. a shaman We're here. <laughs> trying to understand the world. Not, not, yeah. And maybe it is love, but I don't. But, but, but it's it's gooey, uh, mushy stuff inside that that, yeah. that you know moves around and does weird All shit. Right, let's let. We got a heart, we got a liver, yeah. we got a brain, we got blood, we got nerves, we got, you know, uh, bones. And, and you say, Tom, how do you know that? The reason I know that is because, A, I've seen people cut open and I've seen their heart, I've seen their liver, I felt their heart and liver. I can see them on a CT scan, I can see them on an ultrasound, I can see them all kind of places. And Every single medical system and, and human biology theorists have agreed we're made of organs. Chinese medicine, it's all about the flow through the organs. Um, and I, I think there's everybody would agree with that. Okay, let's go further. Let's take one of them, like your liver. What is the liver made of? Uh, it's made of uh, fleshy components and 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 you know the combination of liquids and 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 other, right, other i gotta stop materials. you there <laughs> every every single biologist 
PhD scientist medical doctor would say your liver is made of liver cells, mm. right? Your heart is made yeah. of heart cells, your yeah. et cetera, right? Now, here's the question. How do you know that? Now, the answer is tricky because I can guarantee 100% that nobody has seen liver cells in a living liver. Uh, here's how they do it. They take a person with a liver. You can see the liver. You can take a piece of it. It's called a biopsy. And then you poison that and then you stain it and you look at it under a microscope and it forms into it, it, it you see liver cells or heart or spleen or et cetera. Now, if you get very technical about this, you don't know that that's not an artifact because you don't know that that exists in the liver. In fact, if you do an ultrasound or a CT scan, it doesn't look like they're cells. It looks like a homogenous tissue with a bunch of proteins and membranes in it. And if you even ask yourself the question, why would the body break this liver up into a million little tiny pieces and make communication much more difficult? And here's, the, here's an interesting answer to your question. How did we get there? And Goethe gave a very interesting answer to this. He said, the problem with Western science is we wanted to understand frogs. We want to help frogs. We want to understand what makes frogs work, you know, what they're made of, all these things, right? So what's the first thing we do? We kill the frog. And then we try to find out what it's made of. Now, one thing I know for sure is we didn't help that frog because that frog's dead. And we killed probably a half a million, maybe 10 million frogs trying to find out what a living frog is made of. And what we know is that when you take like bacteria and you stain them, they create structures that weren't there when they were alive. Now, I can't prove to you that there is no cells in a living being, but I can tell you that the theory that we're made of cells started in 1859 with a guy named Rudolf Virchow, because all these Chinese and Ayurvedic and Iranians and Native Americans, they were adamant there is no th such thing as a cell. These are, these are organs through which energy flows. Now, you have a show about water. So what, are, what is a liver actually made of? Again, I, I don't know if I could prove this in a court of law, but I have very good evidence that a, well, let's take a lens. That's an easier example. A lens is organized water. And it's organized by certain proteins that, are, that organize the water so it's transparent to light. Now, the liver uses different proteins, different amino acids, different DNA, different, uh, or exposes different DNA, et cetera, different minerals, lipids, et cetera to create this red gooey stuff that you were talking about. That's its own kind of structured tissue. And when you see it like that, you, you then understand why water is everything. Because we are, in, we are made of compartments of organized water that are in interaction of the purity of the water with the electromagnetic field, which is the energy source, it's like making jello. You take jello, you have proteins, you have water, nothing happens. You heat it, that unfolds the proteins, then it interacts with the water and then forms jello. So it's same thing here. You have proteins, they don't do anything. You have water, you put the source of light or love or you know, ATP is another source that unfolds the proteins, organ, it, it then structures the water to create the form that has the best utility for whatever that organ is supposed to be doing. If it's an eye, it's transparent to light. If it's a, a bursa, it's to protect your knee. If it's to a heart, it's to hold back the flow of the blood. You can then see, so what is a cataract? Very simple, you know, and people could say, well, this is very theoretical, et cetera, but it's actually how I did medicine. So if you take this 
perfectly crystalline, clear tissue called a, cat, a, a lens, and then you expose it to you know, electromagnetic fields or glyphosate, or you don't eat the right proteins or too much, you know, as I like to say, schmutz, which is Yiddish for stuff, then you get a disorganized gel, which is now opaque, right? So the light can't get through. And then you go to the ophthalmologist and he says, you got a cataract. So what does he do? He takes your lens out. Now, I'm not saying that taking your lens out and putting a plastic lens in is like the worst thing in the world, but that's not healing. That's not medicine, really. That's mechanics. And it always comes with a cost because first of all, they sticking stuff in your eye and putting in metal plates and you know, I mean, who wants, I don't want that. Um, and, and, but more importantly, there is literally no understanding of how these tissues actually are organized in living systems and therefore how they get sick. It's all just a superstition. So the, the reason I said that, the answer to your question, how did we go wrong? And we went wrong because we forgot and there's a lot of reasons for this, which I don't need to go into, but we forgot that there's something called life. And here's the interesting conclusion is all medical doctors are taught under the assumption, which by the way, I'd love to see them prove this with a double blind study, that there is no difference between life and non-living things. We are made of non-living things, period. That was Descartes. Again, I'd love to see the proof of that because I don't think it's true. And so in a funny sort of way, your doctor thinks you're dead because he thinks you're only made of dead stuff. So therefore he proceeds to make it a self-fulfilling prophecy and attempt to speed up your demise so that you become dust, which is exactly what he thinks you are because there is no science of life. And if you, as a medical doctor, say, hey, wait a minute, what is this about life? You know, what's the difference? They, they think you're a lunatic. You are not allowed to ask that question. I want to experiment or, or think about the difference between a living thing and a dead thing. No, can't do that. That's why, you know, when you get into, like, what is a brain, you know, it, it, you, know you can't find the mind in the brain. It's, not, it's like looking for the source of, a, of the sound by dissecting your radio. It's just not there. Uh, and yet we can't seem to understand that. And those who don't understand that do unbelievable amount of harm to, to the, the beings of, of the world. And at least that's how I see it. <laughs> Tom, <laughs> you have no idea how profoundly relevant that was for me. You're talking to someone who had cataract surgery, asked the surgeon where the cataract came from, and he couldn't explain it. I knew there was something wrong with that. And right. then I had a, 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 a vitrectomy, right, where they empty out all the liquid in your eyeball. And then I learned about vitreous humor and aqueous humor. He said, don't worry about the jelly. That doesn't do anything. Uh, it'll fill back up with regular water. And I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> I yeah, think right. I just got, I think I just got duped. <laughs> and that yeah, regular water is thick. Yeah. yeah. We, we're not supposed to have any regular water except in the urine. And, you know, there are some places where there's liquid like urine and cerebrospinal fluid. But if you, but here's an interesting fact. If you, if you, 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 if you put like Novocaine or lidocaine, so you have your nerves are filled with this gel fluid. What does Novocaine do? do? It liquefies it. Mm -hmm. And so then the impulse, the electrical impulse can't get through, which is good if you're, you know, taking your tooth out. So you, it stops the nerve flow by converting a electric field, which is the gel, into liquid. And we all know that electricity doesn't flow through water. Uh, so you've converted it into liquid water and and that's, if you have liquid water as a bursa instead of a gel, eventually it's not gonna protect your joint 
and you're going to get osteoarthritis because one bone will erode into the next. Because these two gelatinous sacs not only have physical protection, but they're both negatively charged, so they repel each other. And this is the biology of life, which we don't understand, and not only don't understand, that's one, one could one almost excuse that. We are openly antagonistic. And so if anybody like me says, I, you know, I mean, it's a perfectly reasonable question, I think. Why don't we think about life? No, that's a, that's a lunatic. And <laughs> there we are. <laughs> Instead, let's talk about our mortgage and dust to dust, because that's yeah. much, easily to con much more easily to control and manage right. right through to execution. Tom, I know you're running out of time here. Is there anything you want to leave us with? You know, this has been a profound, uh, fantastic voyage. It really has. I mean, man, you just you just took us down in through the blood, into the heart, explained it all, and then talked about structured water, which we've touched on before, right? And I think you've given a much more complete understanding to us of how it works with life, life-giving charge, right? Life-giving force. But as a few last words down to the last drop, Tom, is there anything you'd like to share with us and all the paddlers and people in the water world that are on the call, you know, as we say goodbye to you? Uh, only that there was a time in my life I actually looked into uh, folding kayaks. And, and I don't remember the name of the brand, but I was almost going to buy one. And then I had this thing with my heart and my wife is set because she sort of hauled me out of there for a second. <laughs> She said, you're not doing that anymore. And so now I, I don't know. I'm thinking about it again. Well, it may just require a little paradigm shift, right? Yeah, but once right. you get to know, once you right. get to know, just... track a little better. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's a reason uh, why I will be in touch. Yeah. Wonderful. Tom, thank you so much. Really. All right. Thank you, you know, guys. You know, a joy and a gift for us. Yeah. Okay. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.